So my name is Amber, uh, and I'm uh, an academic in Lancaster Environment Centre. My research is mostly around the impact of climate change on the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, as I put in chat. Um, so I don't really work on flooding directly, although, of course, as we saw from Ted's presentation, sea levels are rising, which increases flooding and extra water that's going into the oceans, a lot of that comes from the ice sheets. So I guess it is kind of directly relevant from that sense. Um, I'm also theme lead for environment in the Data Science Institute, who have um, provided the, we're, we're going to provide the money to host this conference. And of course, Julia Caridas, who helped doing with Ted with the organisation. Um, so in terms of the methods that I use, I'm quite, quite technical, quite into the physical sort of sciences. So I haven't really done so much on communication yet either. Um, but of course, working on ice sheets and sea level, uh, thinking about communication is really important in terms of translating the research that I do into, into higher level messages. So, so why am I here if I don't do flooding and I don't do communication? Um, that is, um, comes down to the brief that Ted gave me. And that was to, can I say something about collaborative data science, which is certainly something that I'm involved in and socially responsible data science, which again is something I'm certainly involved in. So I called this, this brief presentation collaborative environmental data science, but I could really have called it environmental data science because it's inherently collaborative and that it brings together a whole raft of different disciplines. Uh, and it's inherently socially relevant because of course, as we know, the environment and environmental change is one of the most socially relevant um, issues of today. Um, so I've kind of split this into three parts. The first part is I'm going to give an overview of two of the main collaborative environmental data science projects that we currently have going at Lancaster University. Um, and then I'm going to show a palpto recording of me talking about a specific element of one of those projects to give you a flavour of the kind of research that we're doing. Uh, and then the third part is I put together some thoughts on challenges associated with uh, collaborative environmental data science research. And I thought that would be a good jumping off point for, for discussion. So I'll start off with just discussing the projects. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, yep, excellent, perfect. Now, I was Zooming with my family yesterday and they all said I was quiet, so I thought I'd better check. Um, so the first project I want to talk about a little bit is the Data Science um, of the Natural Environment project. So this is a Lancaster University in CEH uh, project, which was funded by the EPSRC um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and the EPSRC put out a call uh, to provide funding on new approaches to data science. So it was about taking data science methodologies, for example, um, from maths and computer science, uh, and applying them in different ways and developing them in different ways. So we put something in on the environment because we thought, well, it, it's a new approach. Take these methods and techniques that have been developed, for example, to apply to finance and business. And can we apply them to something a bit more socially relevant to environment and environmental change? So we got the funding, which is great. Uh, and it's a five year project. Uh, we have three years left. Um, and um, I guess I also just want to say that it's really driven by DSI. So the Data Science Institute brought everyone together to put this proposal uh, forward. Um, so that was really great. Um, so what we're actually doing is we're doing data science uh, and we're applying it to environmental issues and we see it as very much a co-creation project. So coming back to Laura's ideas of co-creating uh, research, I guess, in this case, rather than data, um, in that it is inherently interdisciplinary. So we need to bring together environmental scientists, we need to bring together data scientists who have the expertise in the technical side of things and also external stakeholders to make sure the things that we do are relevant for, for a wider audience. Um, so we have five postdocs, seven PhD students, and we have six themes. And the themes are illustrated by this kind of matrix you see here on the right. So the way we wanted to go about this co-creation was we wanted to think about it in terms of the environmental science. So we wanted to think, okay, so what are um, high level, difficult environmental science issues we want to tackle? Uh, and we have expertise in, in three areas, we in ice sheet melting, which is me, the theme that I lead. Um, air quality modelling, which is led by Paul Young out of Black, and land use management um, by Paul Harrison. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to bring data science techniques to bear on these challenges to see if we could create new scientific insight. And we also thought by doing that, by bringing um, data science techniques to bear on these complex and heterogeneous data sets, we would develop new avenues to develop those methods. So the three kind of methodological themes that we were going with was integrated statistical modelling, machine learning decision making and virtual lab development. I'm not going to go into great detail about all of those, um, but I just would want to say it's kind of an iterative thing, right? So we use integrated statistical modeling to look at ice sheet melt prediction, and that tells us that we don't yet have the maths to do what we need to do. So we go back and develop our integrated statistical modeling techniques. Um, and that's kind of how it's going. It's um, a really big and involved project. And the um, example I'm going to share in the next section of this talk is a, just one tiny element of, of that overall project. So I hope it'll give you a flavor for the kind of things we're doing. 
So the Data Science and Natural Environment Project has been really successful, not only in terms of doing great science, but in terms of bringing people together as an environmental data science community. So we're doing research on the ground as part of the project, but we're also developing collaborations across disciplines uh, to then spin out and do more work and apply for, for more grants, uh, more PhD projects, uh, and kind of really expand our portfolio of work in this area. So it's been a really great forum uh, for bringing these collaborations together. So as a result, uh, the university and CEH um, decided to invest in making something permanent along those lines. So recently we've launched the Centre for Excellence in Environmental and Data Science, um, which is um, a joint CEH Lancaster University initiative uh, and it has um, 3D funded posts associated with that professorial level. So it really is a significant commitment from, from the, the two institutes. And the aim is to create a world leading research um, institute um, associated with environmental data science. So I kind of see that data science for natural environment project as being the natural ancestor of SEEDS. And in fact, SEEDS is organised in a similar way. So the next matrix on this slide uh, shows you how SEEDS is organised. So we have three different methodological strands, as it were, associated with data acquisition and infrastructure, data science methods and decision making under certain uncertainty, and they intersect with four application areas, air, land and soil, water and ice, which is where I come in, and also biodiversity. As I said, I'm going to show you uh, an example now of um, some work that I've personally been doing as part of the Data Science for the Natural Environment projects. Um, but if you want more information beyond the small snippet that I'm going to share, uh, then the link to the website is just here. And also, if you're a Lancaster University or Centre for Ecology and Hydrology employee uh, and you're interested in SEEDS, uh, I've got the web link there and you can, you're, you're more than welcome to join the centre. Right, so there's a bit of a technical hitch here and I have to stop sharing and then share again <laughs> to get the movie for the next section. And this is where I realise I haven't got it open anymore in my browser. One second. There we go. Can everyone see my pan up show now? Yes, we can see it. Excellent. So I'm going to try playing it. So let me know if you don't hear any sound. And as I said, this is an example of some specific research that I've been doing as part of the uh, Data Science and the Natural Environment Project. Uh, and I recorded this video last week uh, for SEEDS, uh, but I thought it was a, just a good example to show you guys here today. My name is Amber Leeson and I'm the co-theme lead for Ice and Water in the Centre for Excellence in Environmental Data Science. I'm also a glaciologist, and my research is mostly concerned with the impact of climate change on the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. I'm just going to show you an animation now, which shows you why that's important. So both ice sheets have been melting in recent decades, and this picture is showing you just how much Greenland has been melting. So where it's red, it means we're losing ice, it's melting, and where it's blue, it means it's gaining ice, it means it's getting thicker. So you can clearly see here it's a whole lot of red, so we're seeing a lot of melting. And this is important because when the ice moves from the land into the ocean, it can contribute to global sea level rise. So melting ice sheets contribute to global sea level. In the 20 year period from 1992 to 2012, we actually saw about an 8 millimetre contribution to global sea level from the Greenland ice sheet. And this is a bit worrying because it looked like that trend was accelerating. It has actually continued since then, uh, but my research is mostly interested in what's going to happen in the future, so if that trend is going to continue. So these graphs here are from the most recent IPCC report on the uh, potential future sea level rise, and you can see that they are looking at what might happen in the future um, as a result of ice loss from the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet in terms of metres of contribution to sea level. So you can clearly see here that we're expecting more ice sheet melting and a greater contribution to sea level, but that the uncertainty, that's the shading on these uh, lines here, uh, is quite high. And largely that's to do with the models that we use to make these predictions, the computer simulations that go into producing these graphs. So one area of my research is about improving these models. And there are two main ways in which we can do that. So firstly, we can improve our understanding of the physical processes they include, and we can also improve the capability of the models to represent these processes. So data science can be really important in both of these areas, but I'm just going to talk through a quick example of how recent research I've been involved in has been looking at the latter. So it's looking at how we can use data science techniques to improve the capability of models in terms of representing reality. So this is all about the temperature on Greenland, and it's important because when it gets warmer, that's when it melts. So what I'm going to show you here is some temperature data. 
So we've got time along the x-axis and we've got temperature along the y-axis and these are observations from a weather station. So you can see that on Greenland, as you'd expect, temperature varies a bit like this. It's warmer in the daytime and it's colder in the nighttime. Sometimes you have warm days and sometimes you have cold days. So this is really important because it's this behaviour that models don't quite capture. So I'm now going to do the same thing but overlay the equivalent points that are from a model simulation. So they're going to be in pink. So you can see the model does a reasonable job. It's generally capturing the behaviour. It shows that it's colder in the nighttime and warm in the daytime. But what it's not capturing, it's not capturing how warm it gets on these really warm days. So we did an analysis of this for the Greenland ice sheet and we discovered that actually the regional climate models, which is what plot plotted here, struggle a little bit with getting these extreme high temperatures. And so we're doing some work to see if we can improve this. And we're doing this using a suite of advanced statistical tools called extreme value analysis, which is a way of describing these extreme high points in a time series. So I'm doing this in collaboration with Emma Easto, who is a statistician in the Maths and Stats department here at the university, and also our PhD student, Dan Clarkson. And this has been done as part of the Data Science of the Natural Environment project. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take the Greenland temperature data and try and understand why extreme temperature events occur, what drives them, and why the models don't seem to get them right. Ultimately, however, what we want to do is we want to be able to use these statistical techniques to modify the model predictions to bring them more in line with reality. So if you just look back at the curve here at the bit where the models disagree, what we want to do is use extreme value analysis to make the model behave more like the observations. We want to do this so we can then use that model in the future in full confidence it's going to be able to give us accurate estimates of when the ice sheet is going to melt because it's picking out these extreme high temperature events. So this is quite an involved task and we're kind of on the way to completing it so check back with us soon uh, for when we're hoping to have some exciting new science results. Thank you. Okay I'm just going to stop sharing and then reshare so I can get my PowerPoint back up. Is the PowerPoint back? Yes, it is. Excellent. Well, that worked surprisingly well. I'm glad we tested it now. Um, so, okay, but now I can't advance the PowerPoint. There we go. So, yeah, I, I just want to show you a quick example of the kind of work we're doing in the Disney project. Um, but as I said, it's a, a large project with a lot of staff. So it's only a, a brief snapshot of all the stuff that's going on. Um, but I guess I want to show you that as an example because it's one of the things that we really couldn't do if we didn't collaborate. So I am a glaciologist. I don't understand advanced statistics. Uh, Emma Easter is a statistician who doesn't understand glaciology. Uh, but by coming together and working together, I can bring my glaciological knowledge and she can bring her advanced statistical knowledge together and we can do something new. So the sum of the, the two contributions is greater than the sum of their parts. Um, and that's really why I, I do collaborative environmental data science, because there are lots of cool things that I really want to do, but I don't have the skills that I needed to do them. And so by working with other people, uh, I can do more uh, and do more interesting stuff um, and kind of uh, riff off of their expertise as well as bring, bring something of my own to the table. So the final thing I want to talk about are um, challenges of interdisciplinary collaborative working. So I've been doing this for a little while now, so I've been at Lancaster for five years. Uh, and I've been working on environmental data science for pretty much the entire time. Um, so I just wanted to share four challenges that we've come across um, in that time and also as part of the Disney project and, and SEEDS. Uh, and I kind of grouped them under four headings here, although I'm not sure it's exactly um, exhaustive or, or all that everything belongs quite neatly under a particular heading. Um, and the first thing is motivation. So I'm a glaciologist, so I'm interested in the impact of climate change on Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. Um, Emma Easter, the statistician, she's interested in generating new maths. Um, so there's a real challenge there, um, but it's a really exciting challenge in bringing these two things together and finding out where, where the sweet, sweet spot is. So something that is um, answering important glaciological questions, um, but is also developing new statistical methods. So I can get a paper out in, in, in science, for example, on uh, ice sheets melting in the future. And Emma can get a paper out in her um, mathematical journals and this really cool piece of new maths she's developed. Um, so it's been a challenge uh, to align those two different motivations uh, and particularly when you throw other disciplines in the mix. So if you have a project, for example, that's not only um, environmental science and statistics, it's environmental science, statistics and also computer science, for example, or environmental science, computer science and social science. Um, 
so it's it's quite important i think when planning a new work and, and i hope that we'll talk about it as part of this workshop uh, in really nailing down the motivation and making sure that everyone who contributes is getting something tangible out of it and the second thing um, which is kind of related is communication in that it turns out that each discipline communicates in a different way. So the obvious one is the model, the word model. Uh, so to a glaciologist, a model is um, a physics-based simulation of reality. It's a process model, that's what a model is. Uh, and then to a statistician, a model is a statistical representation of some data. Um, so that's just basic level um, semantic type discussion uh, that we have, we, have, we have had to have throughout this process uh, about what we mean by certain things. How do we communicate with each other? Uh, and also communication in terms of uh, the way in which you work. So um, do you supervise students in the same way? Do you have the same kind of input into research projects? That kind of thing. So when you're working across disciplines, you really have to bring these things together and kind of figure out what the best and uh, most efficient way to communicate is. And the third thing is trust, which again has been touched on already this morning. Uh, and that's about trust in lots of different things. Trust in people's data trust people's methods, uh, and mainly it's about trusting people's expertise. So when you're collaborating with somebody and you're doing it in an interdisciplinary way, because you have skills and they have skills and both skills are different, you need to be able to trust the other person's skills and that they can bring uh, the maximum possible um, outcome using their skills to the table. Um, and again, also things like data and um, uh, managing of students. And the final thing is personnel. Uh, so it's difficult to find somebody who is trained in more than one discipline. It's difficult to find somebody who knows glaciology and also knows computer science. Um, I don't necessarily think we should expect, expect that. I think uh, we shouldn't be training uh, glaciological computer scientists going forward, but I think we should be training people to be more intellectually agile. I think we should be training people to have a specialism um, but have the intellectual agility uh, necessary to kind of apply those specialisms to different areas and kind of to jump between um, uh, uh, areas as appropriate for the science question that you're working on. Um, so that was just my, my take on the challenges of interdisciplinary learning, working and I thought that would be a good jumping off point for discussion. Uh, so I'll stop there and if there's any questions I'm happy to discuss questions.